Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, and I'm excited to be reviewing these two wines today. Before we get started, if you're enjoying the knowledge nuggets I'm dropping in my shows and digging what I'm screaming here, <laughs> I know, silly, uh, smash that like button and subscribe and spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This is sample season for us as wine journalists uh, and we are getting emails asking about reviewing wines and other related things too. Today's episode is the first of several I'll be doing over the next few weeks. As I mentioned earlier, I also will be working on my holiday specials soon. These wines came from my good friends at Creative Palette, so thank you, Kate, for sending them. Uh, this is gonna be mostly from Wikipedia and notes provided by Kate. So these wines are from a winery that it's relatively an unknown outside of Portugal uh, called Quinta do Amiel. This historic 1710 estate in Ponte de Lima in Portugal's Vino Verde DOC is widely credited with putting collectible, cellar worthy Loreto based Vino Verde on the map. And speaking of maps, that's my cue to pull up Google Earth. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying my use of Google Earth recently. I I've been enjoying it. Vino Verde is not a great variety. It is a DOC for the production of wine in northern Portugal. The name means green wine, but really it translates to young wine, with wine being released three to six months after the grapes are harvested. This area is known for quaffable white wines, but they also make red and rosé, and they are usually consumed soon after bottling. In its early years of production, Vino Verde was known to have this slight effervescence uh, which came from actually malolactic fermentation taking place in the bottle. Today, most Vino Verde producers no longer follow this practice with the slight little effervescence being added by artificial carbonation. The white wines are lemon or straw colored, <clears throat> have lower alcohol, and are made from local grape varieties, Alvarino, Lorero, Arinto, Tra Trajadora, Aveso, and Azal, plus many others. These are the main grapes used. So Portuguese and Spanish are, com they're related. They are basically the same language, but you might see me stumble a little bit on the pronunciation of Portuguese and revert to Spanish. I have tried to, in my notes, put the phonetic pronunciation of some of these, but sometimes I went, oh, I know how to pronounce that, which I, you saw I kind of stumbled over trajadura instead of, I said tra, instead of trajadura, it's trajadura. Anyway, so out of these, maybe Alvarino sounds familiar. It should. North of the border into Spain is known as Albarino. Loreto, however, yeah, it's a key grape used for Vino Verde. The name derives from Lauro or Laurel in Portuguese. From the information sheet I got from Kate now, Loreto's birthplace is in the Lima River Valley, nested in the larger Vino Verde region. Within that river valley is a small Ponte de Lima district, which is ground zero for the best Lorado and home to 74 acre Quinto de Amial. But in 1999, when former owner Pedro Araujo released his first Amial Lorado, most locals viewed Lorado as a serviceable, quaffable wine to be drunk within six months. Indeed, best examples of Vino Verde were made not from Lima Lorado, but from Alvarino grown outside the Lima subregion. And over the next 20 years, Araujo proved the skeptics wrong. He showed that Loreto could be made into a superb wine as Loreto became a star performer. It became a calling card for the Lima River Valley. Amiel was the area's quality pioneer and today is the area's standard bearer. Among its offerings are wines that can age, evolving gracefully over a period of a dozen years or more. So what are the facts on Loreto's home terroir? Many of us associate Portugal with hot and sunny. The Vino Verde climate, however, is actually mild and wet, around 55 inches of rain a year in Ponte de Lima, Ponte de Lima with both Atlantic and continental influences. Most estates are subject either to major Atlantic influences 
or to continental conditions, leading to grapes that are either underripe and high in acid or overripe and low in acid. In the Lima River Valley, proximity to the river makes the climate milder and Quinta de Amial, the microclimate has just the right amount of moderate Atlantic influence. Thanks to the ideal diurnal temperature variation, grapes hit the sweet spot between ripeness and freshness. Perfect maturity is also helped by Amiel's south-facing vineyards as the estate sits on the right or north bank of the Lima River. Lima River Valley soils are mostly sandy, loam, and granite, but at Amiel and in the Ponte de Lima district, granite dominates. There are also pockets of coarse sandy loam in higher areas and slightly finer, richer soils closer to the river. Thanks to those deep granite soils, the hallmarks of an Amiel wine are tight acidity and rich mineral notes. With this superb terroir as a base, Araujo worked on upping the quality, a process begun when his father bought the estate in 1990. Rigorous pruning, bunch thinning to limit yields to around five tons a hectare, which is about a third of the standard for yields for Loreto, uh, strict selection and manual harvest in 22 kilo boxes. Then and now, the philosophy, as with so many top quality producers, is sustainability in the vineyards and minimal intervention in the winery. No herbicides or chemical fertilizers are used in the vineyards, and biodiversity, such as the controlled growth of selected weeds, is encouraged. After 20 years of hard work, Araujo determined that Quinta do Amial deserved greater exposure. The opportunity to pass the baton to Esperam, a company with shared values and an international presence, led to a seamless transition. So starting in July 2019 with winemaker Jose Luis Moreira da Silva taking over from Araujo in April 2020. As Esperam CEO, Jean Roquette, or it might be Choquechi, so this is something where I used Google Translate to help me with these pronunciations. So when I put in what looks like Jose, or sorry, Joam, it's Joam, but it, it has a kind of a weird look to it. It's Roquette, but in the Portuguese app, it said Choqueshi, Choqueshi. So I have no idea if it's Roquette or some other pronunciation. Anyway, as he puts it, uh, the Arojo name will forever be linked to Quinta do Amial. Since purchasing Amiel, Esperam is looking to push sustainability even further. They are soil mapping in detail, cataloging existing biodiversity, and working with the Institut Francais de la Vigne et du Vent uh, to plan for an unpredictable future affected by climate change. In the winery, Esperam is experimenting with new forms of vinification, such as using concrete eggs. This continues and builds on Araujo's legacy as he was always looking to create different expressions and styles of Loreto. There's Amiel Loreto, which is no oak. Then there's Escolia, which is oak or has oak. And Solo Unico, which is stainless and concrete egg, but without any temperature control. These wines are 100% Loreto made from 100% estate fruit. And then there is our first wine, Bico Amarelo or Yellow Beak. Quinta do Amial's U.S. arrival coincides with the debut vintage of Bico Amarelo. It is a blend of 40% Loreto grapes from Quinta do Amial, rounded out by 30% each of Alvarino and Aveso, sourced from nearby growers. So, Monsalm y Melgasso for the Alvarino and Bayam for the Aveso. As already mentioned, 2019 is the vintage. The suggested retail price is 12 bucks. Grapes are manually harvested and fermented at a cooler temperature of 10 to 15 degrees Celsius or 50 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 days. This allows the preservation of aromas and flavors. The wine stays in stainless steel vats for three to six months at a controlled temperature. Its alcohol is 11.5%. Total acidity is 6.2 grams per liter. The pH is 3.3 and the residual sugar is less than two grams per liter. Production is about 62,500 bottles. Now, from what I can tell, this is actually for all their wines, as the fact sheet for both of these wines has the same number. All right, so let's get into the wine. I am excited to try this wine. I've had plenty of Vino Verde's, or I'm sorry, I've had, I've, I've had Vino Verde, but it's been a while since I've had it. 
but I'm pretty sure the ones that I've had are going to be out of Alvarino, but maybe not. Of course, I've had plenty of Alvarinos out of Spain, and they are very refreshing and delicious. As a matter of fact, a few episodes ago, I had a review of some. Alrighty. It's already it just, it's, I mean, it's really aromatic, and a lot of it could be just because I've, we've effectively aerated the wine a little bit. You know, Corvin does have this ad adapter that really aerates your stuff, and I've, I've never asked them for one, nor do I really care to get one because I, I, I take, it takes so long for me to drink a bottle of wine that it's aerated just fine. All right, and I like to see how things develop over time. So, uh, color's really good. It's, you know, definitely a, a, a deeper color. It's, I mean, it's actually the, the, the foil is very close to what the actual color is on that. So let's just uh, take a little whiff here. So like I said, it was really high, highly aromatic, just coming off the, off the glass. You got this orange and maybe a little bit of guava and some white flowers. So a little bit of floral to it. Get a little uh, orange skin, orange pith. A little bit of yellow, I'm mean, not yellow, uh, lemon. Lemon pith. There's a, um, not a waxiness, but there's this. I don't know how to describe it. Some type of a complexity, non-fruit. It's a non-fruit aroma. You know, actually, there's, there's just really just kind of like this river rock, it's kind of a wet, like wet rock type of thing. And, I mean, we already know there's really no oak, but confirming there's no oak on it. So let's uh, give it a try. So this is really, really, really uh, tasty. I was expecting it to be a little bit, quote, drier or more bitter. Because a lot of times with, and I, again, I know this is not 100% Alvarino or an Alvarino from Rio Spicious. But a lot of times those Alvarinos can come off as a little bit bitter. But I don't really get a lot of bitterness. I get really a smoothness out of this. The, the fruit is actually on that somewhat riper side of things. I wouldn't necessarily call this a new world wine because there's still, it still, there still has a, a dryness at the end. There's still a touch of bitterness at the end, but I usually expect it to be more on the front end with an old world wine, especially something like Albarino um, or, you know, I know Rio Spicious, we're not doing Rio Spicious here, but just my experience with Albarino is more on the Spanish side than the Portuguese side. Um, but, there's a little bit of sweetness fruit that does dry out. It's got that orange and it's got um, a bit of peach to it. The florality is there, but it's, it's a little bit, I guess, richer on the floral, but it's also not as prominent on the palate as it is on the nose for me. There's a slight herbaceousness to it too. Almost like a grass. Maybe that's what I was coming up with like that waxiness that's not waxiness there's a really good delicious factor to this wine my habit is to spit on all my shows of course Halloween I didn't but I really don't want to spit this wine out like I just want to just swallow this wine because it's just tastes so good and it's 12 bucks which wasn't brought up before all this, but Portugal has been, for a very long time, a great place to find value. So this wine, I'm just gonna throw it out there. Obviously a different grape. I mean, this grape is not really produced in a lot of other places, but we'll just say the quality of this wine at $12, or let's say if Portugal had the same costs to make wine that other areas of the world do, this could easily be a $20 bottle of wine. So the quality's there, the flavor's there. Um, it's definitely easy to drink. It's got a little more complexity than say your basic Rio Spicious wine. 
It's got you know the other grapes in there to help add some more complexity to it instead of just being straight Alvarino. So this is really really nice. I could see this you know Asian food. Um, you know, like you know say you're just typical like orange peel chicken, right? The orange is in the in the wine would pair really well with orange uh, orange flavored sauces and that type of stuff. I wouldn't necessarily put this with say a curry or anything that's spicy spicy because there's not enough like sweetness really to, to cover that up or to balance that out. But lighter fare such as that, um, you could definitely do chicken dishes, you could definitely do uh, even pork dishes, and it doesn't have to be Asian style, just, just in general pork dishes. I mean, I can see, use, I can see doing this with, um, you know, schnitzel, that type of stuff. Um, something that has a little bit of richness to it, but not over the top richness. I mean, you could do this with fried foods. It's really good wine. Wow, that's really good. So now I want to compare these two wines. So let's compare this with the 2019 Amiel Loreto. Now this SRP is 18 bucks. So Quinta do Amiel has about 30 hectares of vineyard stretching across 800 meters, about half a mile. 14 of which are planted to Loreto. For the 2019 vintage, uh, they said autumn and winter, so I'm assuming autumn of 2018 to winter of 2019, was very rainy. Uh, and this continued into the spring, but turned drier, which helped bury development. This also helps reduce disease pressure. You don't like to have a lot of moisture there because disease, you know, likes moisture. And the harvest began on September 18th. Now, grapes are sativa certified, and from what I can tell, that means they're non-GMO certified, if I understand that correctly. Like the first wine, fermentation is at a cooler temperature. The wine is aged on leaves for seven months of stainless steel. Its alcohol is 11.5. The acidity is 7.4 grams per liter. Its pH is 3.02, and its RS, or residual sugar, is less than 1.5 grams per liter. So this is a higher acid wine. So it should be brighter, crisper. And I really want to compare these two wines since this only has, what, 30% Loretto? So I'd like to see how the two taste. All righty. And my gas capsule just popped, which is perfect because I'm only doing two wines for the show. So I will replace the gas capsule between shows oh, before I do my next recording. All right, so let's just, so color wise, it's, it's a little, it's about the same. Uh, this one has a little bit deeper yellow color to it. Uh, this has a little more green to it. And they both have, they both have hints of green, but this has a little more green to it. Aromatics are, are actually less. It's not as highly aromatic as this was right off the bat. I get a little bit orange, but I also get, you know, the peach seems to be a little bit more and nectarine. So um, you still have that citrus and that tree fruit type of thing going on. Not so much in the white flowers, but it's a pretty non-aromatic wine for me. Now, I know it has lees aging, and I have a hard time a lot of times uh, detecting lees, especially on the nose. It's got to be really prominent. Because I'm looking for it, because I thought about it, I'm looking for it, I can, I can see there might be what I would call pasta water. So, you know, the water after you cook your pasta in there. So that is usually a marker for me for Lee's, but that's because I think I'm looking for it. Let's just taste it. This is definitely a tart, a tartar, brighter, crisper wine. The acidity is definitely significantly different. Now you may say, well, it's, you know, three point, you know, uh, three point, what, oh, I'm going to scroll, 3.02 versus what, 3.3? Doesn't seem like that much, but remember pH is a logarithmic scale. 
So that small bit, that, that three tenths is actually quite a lot. It's residual sugar is also a full, at least what, half a gram, maybe a little more than a little more than half a gram lower. So it comes across as drier. That's not why this one has that sweeter taste, it's more condition of fruit. But the, the fruit for me is is less ripe. Um, but this is like super refreshing. Now, I don't have this like super cold. I did have it in the fridge for a little while before I pulled it out. And then I pulled everything out, I finished my setup, <clears throat> and it took a little while for me to get to the wine. So they've warmed up to a pretty good evaluation temperature. These are warmer than serving temperature, but they're good for evaluation. They're not, they're not perfectly at room temperature. I don't wanna say perfectly, but they're not right at room temperature, which can make white wines, especially of this style, really harsh. Um, but, it's really refreshing. There's more of a lemon lime component to this. This is kind of more on the Pinot Grigio side of things. Lemon lime, the pasta water is there, but it's for me not really prominent. So that's another thing, you know, it could, you know, the lees aging, that could take you into Pinot Grigio, it could also take you into Chablis with a higher acid, maybe not this high of acid, but a higher acid, somewhat kind of neutral wine. This is really my first, I think my first experience with 100% Loreto. So I know that Albarino and Pinot Grigio, Gruner Veltliner, and then Chardonnay and, and a Chablis style can be very neutral in character. And that's not a bad thing, that's just a reality of what it is. Uh, there's a little bit of green apple to it. It's really kind of like that 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 sour, that, that that kind of sour green apple candy type stuff. So it's got that, it's got the lemon, the lime, a little bit of green apple. I probably would, I probably, especially looking at the color, I would probably call this Chablis. Like good quality Chablis, like, you know, in this $18, right? Probably could sell the same quality level as a Village Chablis, not Petite Chablis, but like, like Chablis. And um, it's really refreshing, again, you're, you're thinking maybe more on the seafood side of things. I, this one you do seafood, but it was because of the orange and that kind of sweetness of fruit, I was thinking a little more richer foods, but this I can see doing with just straight up seafood. Uh, I'm not an oyster fan or seafood fan at all, but I think this would be a good oyster wine. You could, again, the, the same foods that would pair well with this should pair well with, with, uh, with this one. It's a really delicious and, and really refreshing wine. It's got that lemon zest, that lime zest, somewhat of a margarita type of mix thing going on. It makes your mouth water a lot. It's really refreshing and tart. It's good wine. I like it. Heck yeah. Thanks, Kate, for sending me some wine. All right. So that's today's show. Uh, basically, this is my first true review under, uh, you know, under the new brand. Uh, and I'm excited to do some more reviews. I've got a cool holiday theme show that's going to be coming soon in addition to my usual holiday specials. And uh, you know, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, you know, hey, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. And then tell your friends. That's the best way to help me. Until next time, salute.